Let's go ahead and get started. Um, first off, uh, my name is Chad Hensley. I'll be the moderator for the session. On, on behalf of the Carolinas chapter of the ACI, I want to welcome, welcome you to our Architects Day session uh, panel discussion on constructability. We wanted to focus uh, today's discussion around the, uh, the, the subject of constructability and um, how utilization of all the team members and all the talent in the room can result in a uh, constructible design and all the benefits that come along with that. So uh, our guests are, uh, we have uh, Jimmy Kapushman. Uh, he is a quality control manager and project manager with uh, Pucker Construction Company. Uh, he is here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Jimmy graduated from the University of Florida with a BS in construction management and has over 15 years of experience in the construction industry. Uh, his certifications include LEAD AP, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Quality Control Manager, uh, OSHA 30, and CPR and First Aid. We also have with us Mark Hershey. Uh, Mark is a structural engineer and an associate with Baldridge and Associates Structural Engineers, a Chicago office, and has worked on a wide range of projects, project types that include residential, office, retail, education, aviation, military, and high rise. He is a licensed structural engineer in states of Hawaii and Illinois uh, with expertise in design for both high seismic and high wind regions. Uh, design for blast mitigation and progressive collapse uh, and design of temporary construction such as formwork and shoring. He is a voting member of ACI 347 formwork and is associate member of ACI committee 134 concrete constructability. We also have with us Andy Steele. Uh, Andy, uh, with over 18 years of, ex of pro professional experience, Andy has worked on a variety of projects in education uh, federal and commercial and retail. His primary role is performing the duties of the project architect and project manager for many projects that have spanned a wide range of project scales and budgets. Andy served as a project manager for the, the new uh, USA ACE Savannah uh, District Pierce Terrace Elementary School. His, ro his roles included the management of construction documents and design development uh, consultant coordination and coordinating efforts uh, with the design team and Pucker Construction. Andrew also uh, oversaw the construction of the project from design side uh, all the way through the project's completion. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mark Hershey, who is going to do a short presentation on the project and uh, just to show you exactly that's the only way for you to understand how much different this, uh, this project is than what you would typically think of uh, for an elementary school. So in, or, uh, Mark, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to you, man. All right, thanks, Chad. Let me get screen shared here. All right. Make sure people can see this all right. Everybody look at my presentation now. Yes. All right. So this is going to be a panel discussion on the constructability aspects of this project. As uh, Chad said, we'll be, he'll, he'll be leading the panel and then uh, participants will be myself, Andy Steele with FGM Architects and Jimmy Kappersman from uh, Petra Construction. All right, project. So this project was uh, called Pierce Terrace Elementary, Elementary School. It was to replace the existing Pierce Terrace Elementary School um, in Columbia, South Carolina, actually on Fort Jackson, which is a uh, U.S. Army installation down there in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, it was a pretty big school. It was 75,000 square feet. Um, it was design, build, delivery method, which is common for federal construction, uh, where the uh, the team lead is actually the contractor and then they hire the design team from there. Um, this one was a little bit weird in that normally federal jobs are only managed by the US Army Corps of Engineer with maybe input from other um, with from from other departments. This one was kind of co-managed by the uh, 
U.S. Um, Army Corps of Engineers, specifically the Savannah District. And then uh, they also had the Department of Defense Education Activity heavily involved in this project. So it was, uh, it was almost like having two bosses, which was fun. Um, so this is kind of the org chart for this project, just to give everybody a little idea. There was, uh, the U.S. Army Corps kind of took the reins, but Dodea was very, very involved throughout the process. And then there was the design build contractor, which was uh, Petra Construction, who Jimmy is here with. And then uh, there was the architect kind of leading the design team with Andy from FGM and under them was us, who is a structural engineer and ATFP consultant. Uh, we also have Rick Partnership who did MEP and TW TWM who did civil. And then of course the rest of the uh, design build team, there was special inspection who was Schnabel engineering, um, I believe in the Columbia area. And then uh, subcontractors and vendors, including the PCS group who did the ICF for the project and ready mix suppliers, including Capital Concrete and Argos. So the project introduction. So this, this elementary school, the owner's vision was to provide a 21st century learning environment, um, which is different than the schools that most of us went to where everybody is kind of in your individual classrooms and you stay there all day long. Or if you're you know, in an older grade, you might move from classroom to classroom, but the focus being on individual classrooms. Um, in the 21st century learning environment, it's much more flexible than that um, to accommodate kind of a group learning where the classroom kind of breaks down into uh, a neighborhood instead where there's a lot more kids and a lot more activities going on. So it needs to be a flexible and adaptable facility um, they like to use the facility as a teaching tool, both indoor and outdoor. So there's actually outdoor learning areas as well, which is becoming even more important in the age of COVID. So kids can go outside and uh, be a little safer out there. Um, they want to use the school as a teaching tool. So that means leaving building systems exposed when you would normally hide them so that they can be used to teach the students. And then also using providing controls and um, feedback from the building system that we'll see in a little bit to see perhaps how much energy a certain neighborhood of the school is using and they can have little friendly competitions to see you know who can who can uh, preserve the most energy and then as you can imagine there is now technology embedded throughout the facility which is different than we we all had growing up um, the unique aspects beyond just the silver or beyond just the uh, school aspects uh, this is a military on a military installation, so there is anti terrorism and force protection that we had to uh, last mitigation and design for someone setting off a bomb outside. Um, on the construction side, there are security requirements for site access. You can't just have anybody roll up in a truck and, and start working on the project. They got to get through uh, the entry control first. Um, since it is federal and military, they have some unusual specification requirements that aren't necessarily normal for what you would see in private construction. They are normal for federal construction, but if you're used to private, it'll be a little bit odd to you. Um, and then we had to uh, meet environmental aspects and, and, and get certified as lead silver for this project. Um, this project being in South Carolina, there are environmental challenges. You know, it's the Southeast, so there's hurricanes that you have to uh, design for, uh, rain and humidity, lots of rain and humidity, which you know, is a problem both for the finished job and then also to deal with during construction because it's a constant force. And then being in South Carolina, there are actually, it actually is a high seismic environment where this, this school was. So we had to deal with earthquakes as well. And if that wasn't enough, we also had a very fast schedule for this project. Um, Foundations were pushed ahead of the remaining building design to allow grading to begin before the building was done being designed. Um, and the schedule involved going from our notice to proceed to 100% construction documents in uh, six, maybe seven months. And uh, for a private job, that might seem kind of normal. For a school job, that's, re that's really kind of quick. And for a military school job, that is very, very quick because that also includes time for government reviews of which there are usually at least two to three, and they usually need at least three to four weeks to review each one before we can even kind of keep going. 
And so when you only have six months total, the review time really kind of eats into it. Um, how did those goals translate to the design? We had an open floor plan, really minimal interior structure, um, several large gathering areas. So normally schools will have, you know, a cafeteria, maybe a theater, definitely a gymnasium. We had much more than that from a gathering standpoint. Um, to divide up into smaller groups when they need to, there was a large amount of movable partitions that they had in this project to uh, be able to open things up when they want open areas, but close things off when they want to you know, get some smaller groups going. Uh, we were exposing structure and building systems to provide opportunities to learn and explore. Um, there was a lot of roof transitions going on to bring in natural light as part of both the aesthetics and then the uh, environmental aspects. And then, as we said, technology everywhere, which includes screens, smart boards, sensors, controls for solar panels and wind turbines, and among other things. And so we wanted to kind of, you know, we can say a bunch of a bunch of things about the project, but it's probably easier to just show you some finished pictures. So these are actual pictures of the project. These are not renderings. And you can see this is actually a classroom. And it looks much different than probably the classroom that a lot of us grew up with in that it's wide open. There's a lot of different areas for gathering and teaching. And this would be where actual multiple uh, classes would be together at one time. And then you can divide it off with uh, partitions. And Jimmy and Andy, you guys can jump in and say anything you want. Uh, this one is a, kind of the main multi-purpose area where it's kind of a cafeteria slash auditorium. And there's actually, this is not the gym. There's a gym in this area as well. Um, the got a good example of operable partitions in the background where we have about an 80 to 100 foot long operable partition that is open now, but could be closed off to uh, close this area off from the kind of the main corridor that is in the background there. And you can kind of see in the, uh, at the ceiling, you start seeing some of the, some of the building systems exposed. You see that way more here. This is another classroom or a neighborhood, as they call them, where they've got a kind of kitchen area where you can teach teach that aspect. Lots of areas for sharing and boards and all that sort of stuff. You now there are familiar elements here from what we may have grown up with in school, but it's definitely much more wide open than we had before. And then this would be kind of the main corridor, and you can see here that this is. You, you get some of the natural light here at the clear story windows, and then uh, you get a sense for kind of the technology that is ever present. This is one shot, and I think there's half a dozen screens in this shot, and this isn't even a classroom. This is a, this is a hallway. Uh, basic structure, just to give a background, the roof is metal deck on open web joists with a standing seam roof. Exterior walls are uh, ICF, insulated concrete forms with a brick veneer. Um, that was mostly to uh, help with blast, but also helped with thermal and maintaining an air barrier. Uh, interior structure was steel columns, mostly uh, just standalone columns to keep things as open as we could with occasional masonry shear walls as we need. Uh, gym was all precast walls, actually insulated precast walls and foundations were shallow for this project. And here are some exterior shots of the project as well. So this is the main entryway with some uh, canopies for uh, keep kids covered while they're entering and waiting for buses. This is actually an exterior shot of one of the main neighborhoods in the school for one of the grades. And then this is the overall view of the school. So that's kind of it for our presentation. Um, Andy or Jimmy, did you want to add anything for the presentation or do you want to get straight into the uh, panel discussion here? Uh, yeah, Mark, this is Andy with FGM. I'll, I'll just kind of add, this was a, a true 21st century learning environment. Uh, you know, at FGM Architects, we, uh, our history is K-12 education, uh, starting in 1945. And uh, we thought we've seen a lot and done a lot. And uh, this project for sure kind of pushed the boundaries a little bit from what we were used to seeing as far as uh, uh, the general configuration of classrooms or you know, so learning studios, as they were called here. So uh, it, it took us to school a little bit too, and uh, not only learning, like you mentioned previously, the uh, USACE and the DODIA aspect, but uh, just kind of a different uh, mindset around uh, of learning and how uh, the government sees 
uh, learning for their military children uh, moving forward. So it was a, it was a, a challenging but very interesting project too that I uh, enjoyed being a part of. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll stop sharing here and we can kind of dive right in there, Chen. Okay. Well, thank you for that presentation, Mark. Uh, that is an incredible school. And uh, Jimmy, my hat's off to you. <laughs> that took a lot to get uh, to get that finished in the condition that, uh, that, that the picture showed. So um, I, uh, I can really appreciate the effort that, that had to take that had to take place. So, uh, you know, as I said before, we really wanted to concentrate on uh, utiliz utilization of everyone's talents to try to get through uh, challenging projects and just deliver that message that, that that's that's much more achievable if you take the, the contractor and architect engineer and a collaborative environment and you can create um, it, it's it's amazing what you what you can do uh, and uh, you know throughout to basically build a plan and work that plan um, so anyway I wanted to uh, let's start off with some questions and at the end of these questions, we're happy to take any questions from the uh, from the audience, uh, the folks that are joining us online. So we'll start off with um, I'll start off with a question for Andy. Um, so what after going through this project, and what type? Of, what are some of the attributes you would look for in team members on a design build project, including uh, the design professionals, obviously, but uh, also the contractors, subcontractors, material suppliers, et cetera? Well, anybody who's yeah, been a part of these projects know the, the fine line of criteria that, that we have to meet and, and, and abide by. In our team, uh, knowing the requirements, especially with the ATFP uh, and the structural requirements, you know, working with a, a firm like BASE was great with their back history of uh, military work, but their uh, experience with the uh, BLAST and ATFP, you know, our other consultants, uh, Brick Partnership and GWM uh, are both companies that are based here in St. Louis along with us. And uh, so we had years and years and years of experience of working with them uh, on K-12 or educational projects. So they were, uh, after we uh, got uh, together with BASE, we had a great team. And then uh, with Pedro Construction, uh, also in the Midwest, we, we've done several school projects with them. And uh, so we had a very strong comfort level of going into this project with them and knowing their abilities and, and how to approach this. Uh, you know, they've added some team members out east uh, in their Charlotte location with Jimmy, who um, as far as a QC manager and a general, like I say, a team leader uh, on site was great to work with in regards to flexibility, uh, you know, addressing situations as they would come up. Any, you get into a project, you know, things are going to happen. Things are going to come up and uh, everyone's uh, practical approach to problem solving was, was paramount in this, this project and uh, just continuing to uh, strive for the common goal of uh, our completion date. You know, when you go into these projects, you have a, uh, a rolling clock from the minute you get that notice to proceed from the government to the time it has to be done. And uh, we had some, some challenges and some, and some obstacles along the way, but, uh, we were happy to meet those deadlines and those goals. You know, moving forward, I would say that we look for uh, team members that uh, will, will work with us uh, and, and complement the design, but also have the tools and the abilities uh, to do collaborative design and a design review uh, to put a solid product out there that we can uh, we can put together and meet the RFP requirements. Very good, um, Jimmy. Can you? comment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of to go on what Andy said there, um, it, it was nice working as a team on a lot of these issues when they come up. No, no design's perfect, um, but the nice thing was no personality on the way either. Um, everyone was willing to listen to everyone's options and, and, and propose solutions and work together to develop it. Um, again, what Andy said also with, with the the distance between us, technology really helped us to work together, um, utilizing, you know, uh, Zoom meetings and, and screen share and, and all that. Um, it wasn't every time we ran into an issue, we needed to, Andy and Mark needed to come from, from St. Louis to come to the job site. They were able to, to provide us a solution from afar. 
Um, but that was that was a huge asset. So um, you know, again, it, the the design team also realized we were under a tight deadline. If we asked a question, we didn't get put on the back burner, and five, seven, ten days later, we're finally getting an answer. It's they would seem like they would drop everything they were dealing with and kind of jump on board and get us an answer as quick as possible, which is huge with with such a tight schedule. So, and then also to kind of go on the, the question you asked. Um, you said, what are you looking for as far as subs, vendors, suppliers that can help with a project like this? Well, this being a federal project, it, it has its own limitations anyway, as far as, you know, by American um, getting onto a military installation. So you, there's a benefit to contractors that have actually worked with the federal market that know what they're up against. So you're not fighting them to the nail. Uh, they're trying to send a guy to the job site that has a criminal record. He can't get on. Um, they're trying to send us products made in China. You know, they know what they're up against, and it helps us in the field to expedite the installation. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Where are your comments? Yeah, I, I kind of echo, and I, I think the, the big thing is making sure that people recognize, like Jimmy said, that no design is perfect. There's always going to be coordination items that need to be figured out in the field, whether it's products that we designed to and thought were available that are no longer available or are no longer, you know, within our price point or whether that's just, you know, pe we had a very quick schedule on design. So, I mean, if you have f six months to do something, it's a lot easier to miss stuff than if you have 16 months to do something. So it's, it, it's important to recognize that no design is perfect, but then also from a designer standpoint, it's important to recognize that contractors are not going to, do it perfect every single time. As good a job as Petker does, uh, you know, in, in building things, they they do screw up occasionally, and that's okay. Every contractor does, every sub does, and it's important to work with them and come up with solutions that kind of get you to where you need to be, rather than point fingers and you know say, oh, you guys screwed this up or you screwed that up. I mean, there there are times and places for that. But usually that time and place is not when you're under the gun to get this project finished on time and try to hit a budget. So it's important to kind of keep those impulses in check and stay focused on we need to move the project forward and arguing about whose fault it is or who's going to pay for what isn't, isn't really helpful to achieving that goal of getting things done on time. You can always argue after the fact. And, and, you know, sometimes that needs to happen. But fortunately on this project, we had everybody who realized that, you know, we're under the, we're under the gun here. We had to get it done. And the time to argue is not now. We all need to come together for a solution. So fostering that problem solving um, atmosphere was really important. And that comes from, I think, everybody. I mean, it comes from, Petker being the design build team leader, and it comes from Andy being the design leader, and then it goes down to every individual kind of buying into it as well. And I think this project was pretty successful there. We had some instances where there was things that came up that wasn't done right, either in design or construction, and nobody really argued. Everybody just worked together to figure out, okay, this is where we are. This is where we need to be. How do we get there? Yeah, today's uh, legit, the litigious uh, type of environment, I mean, you really have to fight uh, what the norm is to create that environment that you're talking about, which uh, I think all of us would agree is much more productive, you know, trying to make sure we understand what the, uh, what the, what the best solution is given uh, where you are now. Uh, you know, that's kind of what you have to look at all the time. So, uh, I can really appreciate the effort you guys put forth in, in, in creating that environment, living up to it and, you know, signing multiple companies up for that kind of uh, commitment to a job is, is, is impressive. Okay. Well, let's start, uh, let's, let's have another question here. Um, so specifically on collaboration, you know, and how, how you, uh, I'd like to know how, you would recommend that you lay the groundwork in the beginning of a project uh, for good communication and problem solving efforts uh, that'll last through the entire project. And let me, skip, let me go to uh, Jimmy on that one. So 
so as far as the design aspect, um, you've got to have a really strong pre-construction meeting. Come come to the table, get all the participants. I mean, everyone that if you've got key subcontractors, if you you know your designer, your your consultants, the owner, the the construction manager, whoever, get everyone to the table. Let them let them hash it out. Take a day or two. Don't skimp on a pre-conference meeting or a pre-construction meeting because um, there's a lot that can be understood from a meeting like that. And then you've got those before construction or design even starts. Um, and, and a big thing in the federal market is you've got uh, preparatory meetings as well. And that, that's huge for your subcontractors. You, you bring them out and, and I don't know if it's not, it's kind of overlooked in the, in the non-federal market, that meeting and the importance of it. You know, everyone wants to get to work, get to work, get to work. But there's a lot to be said when you sit down with your subcontractor before they start their future of work and say, hey, here's the plans. Here's the specs. Let's go over it. Is this constructible? If it's not, tell us why. Um, and do you have any problem with doing it this way? And you'll get a lot of times, I mean, rarely does a subcontractor come to those meetings and not say, hey, guys, here, I have an issue with this. Well, I want to change it this way. I want to do that. And if you can get ahead of it by a day or two days, then then you're not, um, then you're not actually uh, building it incorrectly, wasting your time constructing it, and then then fixing it or tearing it down or whatever. And, and you know, that, that's a huge aspect or, or benefit to, to get everyone on the same page. Yeah, I, I think that's really the, uh, one of the major points to the entire conversation is pushing those, the, the recognition of those type situations to the beginning of the job or earlier, or the, earlier than that, if you can, you, you know, you want to, you want to, um, uh, address things before you have a bunch of people standing out in the field trying to do a piece of work and it is not working out. So, um, yeah, if, if anybody could take one message away from the, from the, the meeting or the uh, session, I think that's, that's probably a, as good a one to take away as anything. Mark, can you uh, comment on that? Yeah. So that's been a key aspect. Actually, I've seen that start to bleed over into the private sector too actually on other projects is having those pre-con meetings not only for the entire project but when you're about to start big packages as well is get everybody in the room contractor sub including having designers who can you know we can usually do it on over the phone because there's not as much for us but being able to answer questions right away as you know this is a problem uh, we have we're we don't want to build it this way or we can't build it this way. Can we tweak this a little bit? And then you can get feedback immediately from the designers, you know, whether that's important to me or whether it's not. So that's, I think that was helpful during the process. And then uh, on the design side, and Andy can talk about this as well, just sharing models, being, having the, commu the communication going more or less constantly. I think that's one aspect that Jimmy touched on earlier where getting quick responses you know, if they have to wait seven to 10 days, then it's kind of a problem. And that's the case during the design period too. So during the entire process, actually design and construction, we, we talked as a team, you know, even informally, it would be pretty much every single day. I'd have a phone conversation with either Andy or Jimmy or both. And, uh, and, and that was, I think, really helpful to set things, set things up for success. Andy, what are your comments? I would agree. Um, so uh, at the time, unfortunately, we weren't fully utilizing some of the collaboration tools that are available today, like A360 for BIM, uh, for Revit. You know, we were still a little bit old school in the fact that we were sending and sharing Revit models uh, frequently, you know, every three to four days, uh, for sure weekly. Um, with tools today, we can get a lot better response time. We can uh, see real-time changes and, and keep up. Uh, we, you know, as part of the design process, we had regular meetings with uh, Petgers folks, uh, their, their um, pre-construction folks, uh, project manager. I think we were at least bi-weekly in our office and we were hashing out details. We were looking at challenges, uh, whether it be you know, constructability, whether we looked at to, to, um, simplifying details or construction. We, con we constantly had that feedback of different ways to look at things outside the box. Sometimes in, in architecture and design bid build scenarios, you're kind of in a vacuum, so to speak, of designing uh, and usually for bid, and then you work out changes in the field or issues in the field with detailing or, or constructability. 
or in this case, we tried to head most of that off before we even got to uh, to this middle process uh, with our, our teammates. Uh, that was huge. Uh, I'm very big in communication. Uh, it's not just email, it's on the phone. Also, uh, Marcus Wright, I probably uh, wore his phone out in some respects uh, talking about detailing, but we wanted to get it right. We wanted to, um, we wanted to streamline the process. We wanted to not lose time, uh, whether it be during design or in construction, uh, you know, 15 minutes now saved hours or days later. So that was kind of our mindset going into this, you know, since then we've, we've kind of changed our, um, our processes a little bit when it comes to uh, design and, and software and, and trying to keep things more uh, up in real time. But uh, that was kind of the method we had to go about with this project. And it, it worked well because everybody, um, everybody was open. Everybody um, provided the feedback. Had personalities, like Jimmy mentioned, did not get in the way. And we just uh, all had a common goal. We just worked towards it. So we have a couple of questions from uh, from the audience about the um, uh, design being constructible and um, how that helped meet schedule. Uh, can you um, elaborate some more on uh, any decisions that were made to make uh, the design more constructible um, than, than others have in the past, um, given this relationship. And um, let's just take it from there. Maybe, uh, Jimmy, can you, can you elaborate on that, Amy? Uh, a little bit. Um, so, so utilizing, the, the funny thing is the way that, the way, there's a little backstory to this project. Um, the reason that this project being a Dodia school was actually designed build uh, was due to the timber industry. So uh, timber industry lobbied Congress, which Dodia schools were very specific on the way they are, they're designed. Uh, and that was one of the hard parts of this was they had something in the back of their mind, the specific way they wanted this building to look, to be built, to function. And it wasn't a typical government project where you get an RFP and they say, okay, go ahead and design and come back to us and tell us, tell us what, you, you know, show us your plan. They were hands-on involved from day one. We don't like this wall here. We don't want this room to be, you know, here. We want this wall to be an uh, uh, operable wall that's clear glass. They were very specific on what they wanted. Um, and again, the reason was the timber industry went, I don't know, years ago and, and lobbied Congress and they had said, hey guys, all these, these government projects that are coming out are, are steel, uh, CMU, uh, concrete. None of them, you guys aren't using uh, wood anymore and that's a problem for us so the government said okay well we've got a we got a project coming out of Dodia school coming out you know what we're gonna do we're gonna put in the RFP that it's a, it will make a design build and we'll let people come up with the way they want to construct it the designers the contractors they can come together and, and they can use any material and and wood will be allowable um, so we went back and forth I think we we at one point designed this as a free interest Andy step in if I'm wrong uh, because I came in after, you know, about 30% into design. I think we had it as a pre-engineer metal building early on and kind of utilizing that. Um, and then we settled on um, ICF because it allowed for the blast requirements, the seismic, and it allowed for um, the insulation factor and all that. And we figured that was the quickest, uh, quickest method to get the walls up and get the, the, steel in and the roof on so we can get dried in and start hanging our you know ductwork and start framing our walls and doing doing all the stuff that that you know takes takes a little bit of time on the inside of the building so as far as constructability i know we we kicked it back and forth in india if you want to like i said jump in i know we kicked it back and forth with a bunch of different items um and long story short uh the timber industry actually never uh, i don't think any of the five proposals used wood for the framing on this project due to blast requirements. And the, uh, in looking at design, one of the major things we looked at too was not only the materials that met the, the blast requirements or the building requirements, but what the labor and workforce in the area would allow uh, for speed and time. And so we, we studied, as Jimmy mentioned, a pre engineer metal building frame. We studied uh, CMU walls. We studied uh, stud cavity wall construction. And once we looked at all those variables, that's where the idea of ICF walls came for the majority of the structure or the exterior envelope and then also precast uh, panels uh, for the gym. We thought the, the, the idea behind it was to get that gym up 
uh, enclosed, use it as a staging storage area, and then follow along with the ICF around the perimeter. Uh, like Mark mentioned, we had very limited CMU inside the building uh, so that we can get the structure in place and then we could start trying to get it in the drive. You know, most of the masonry obviously is the brick veneer on the outside. But uh, that was some of the variables that we, we kind of looked at is what meets the RFP, what fits in our price point, and what can we get done in the schedule that a lot a lot that was a lot for the project and that's kind of where all the variables came together for this system okay thank you and I'll, I'll dig in a little bit into like what did we actually change in our design to make things more constructible because we we approached it kind of with that in mind to because we knew we were under the gun we knew it had to go quick um so there are several things that we did to try and keep things constructible um the icf was was one, um, I mean, it's kind of a, you eliminate the formwork aspect, so that kind of helped in that you were kind of stacked, it was almost like a hybrid between masonry and concrete, and that you're stacking block, ICF blocks like you would for masonry, and then pouring concrete in there almost like you would grout it. Um, now, one of the challenges that we've had on previous projects with ICF is, um, since there isn't formwork that you pull off when you're done with it, you don't necessarily know the quality. You don't have a visual cue for the quality of the concrete that you're getting at the end. So um, we've had issues on projects before where they ended up finding voids in the concrete, sometimes large voids, um, that we actually made some changes based on past experience and the feedback from Petker and uh, actually having the uh, vendor on board was helpful to figure out what kind of their priorities were. So we, we made some tweaks to kind of the concrete mixtures in the specifications to make sure that we had something that was workable, but wasn't at a risk to uh, blow out the uh, ICF forms so that we could kind of play defense a little bit and try and eliminate those voids before they could even happen. Um, and there are some, you know, competing priorities there. We don't want voids. Meanwhile, the ICF guys don't want their, uh, which would normally mean we would want a very, uh, wet mixture that could just kind of flow into into the uh, forms. Meanwhile, the forms, they are foam, so you don't want too wet a mixture because you'll blow them out at the bottom. And uh, we were actually helped a little bit on that because the, the uh, federal government limits you to four to five foot lifts when we were pouring concrete. So we were able to actually go with a little bit, maybe of a wetter mixture than we would have been able to do if they uh, forced us to, or if they allowed us, I should say, to stack the whole thing, you know, 12, 15 feet high, just pouring from the top. Um, we also made adjustments at our rebar detailing based on previous projects. You know, one of the things that we had it happen to us on previous projects, and it doesn't seem like much until you go out there and actually look at it, is just like trimmer bars around windows and door openings. Normally, we would just throw the number four throwaway steel in there, or number five, or whatever it is and you just put them side by side, extend them past the edges of the openings and just put corner bars in, which is fine. But, you know, if you've got a thinner wall with a, with a mix that isn't maybe as wet or it's hard to work with, uh, we had, that can actually contribute to our voids. So we actually were very deliberate in how we detailed this project to try and eliminate side by side rebar congestion that could actually dam up the concrete and cause those voids. And we, reflected those in our drawings and made sure it was clear to Petker what we were going for during both shop drawings and then meetings and stuff. Um, and I don't think we really had that many void issues on this project like we've maybe had in other ones. Um, now connections of steel to ICF can be difficult because you've got kind of foam in there that you got to deal with. So we, we used a lot of embed plates to connect them together and I think usually we would kind of hang those off the side of the ICF. We'd cut away some ICF that matched the, uh, match the size of the embed plate and then it would kind of almost serve as your form at those locations. Um, but like anything else, nobody's perfect. There are cases where embeds would get missed and the nice thing about that is we do still have concrete underneath so you can actually cut away the ICF and do a post installed connection just like you would for a normal concrete wall and then just put the foam back at the end. Um, so there was, you know, that's just kind of the concrete aspects. There are steel aspects too, where we made a bunch of changes to how we detailed things based on kind of the workforce available. We tried to limit field welding, that sort of things. We had 
a lot of cantilevers and moment frames out at the canopies where they were just single columns. And we, you know, the easy thing for us would just be to do full pen welds everywhere for those, but we decided to go with a bolted connection instead that was a little bit more design work for us, but went up pretty easy in the field because you're just molting things together just like you normally would. Some examples of what we did to try and keep things constructible and play defense a little bit, try and eliminate the possibilities for mistakes by Petka or their subs or just things that are difficult to do and make it a little easier and quicker for everybody. Yeah, those are great examples. Um, way to, you know, bring it to the, to the beginning of the job. So it's not a, it's not a real problem. You yeah. know, if you're solving it early like that. Okay. So, um, so just reflecting on that a little bit, our next question is what, uh, what type of tools and technology were helpful when the project team is spread out over such a large geography, Chicago, St. Louis, Charlotte, and Columbia, uh, to name just you guys, but I'm sure there were others on your team from other places. So how did you, how did you um, facilitate a collaborative environment with that kind of geography? Well, we just use a lot of the tools that were available to us. We, we use technology to our advantage, phone, Zoom, screen shares, collaborative markup sessions, progress prints, that we just did the best we could with the tools we had. Um, it, I'm finding personally that now with distance, uh, even more so in the current time, that uh, we're, getting, we're getting over that uh, that initial fear, that curve of, oh, we're spread out, we can't do this, and we just, we're effective. Uh, you know, I think we just rise to the challenge, and I'm sure that majority of firms and contractors around the country are experiencing that more so now than ever. But uh, we just use the tools that we had and just regular communication. It's the best that we could do. Yeah, I would, I would agree now, with that. And I, I think, actually, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of meetings that uh, are more productive in this type of environment and there are some that are less, you know, but, um, you know, my experience has been some meetings that have taken two hours in the past now take 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I can appreciate that. I think all the whole industry is, has taken up probably a five or six year leap forward in, uh, in, in dealing with remote, uh, needs there. So, now, well, I'll jump in there real quick. Now, while we were able to utilize all the technology, um, there were some meetings that just still had to occur, occur on site. Um, you know, there, were, there was one, Mark, I'm sure you remember it. I called you and I think your wife was, uh, her due date was what, two weeks away? And I pretty much had to say, look, I, I can't get it. I need you out here, man. And, and I appreciate it. You jumped on a plane, you came out. And, uh, but that was, you know, there are some things that just can't be solved via FaceTime or, or, you know, Zoom or, or, or screen share, or whatever. Um, and that's, that's just something about our industry that I think we'll never get beyond. Well, we might, I can't say never. That's a, that's a strong word to say, but that will be something very tough for us to, to ever get beyond not needing a face to face meeting. Um, but, it did cut down on, on a lot of travel. Um, a lot of trips were saved by a, a, a screen share or a photo, um, whatever, the, whatever we utilized at that time. And I think meetings like that, where it just really has to happen in person, you know, that was, like you said, I think it was like a month after my, my kid had been born. So I was still on, I think I was maybe even still on paternity leave, but, uh, because we had been so collaborative remotely the whole time, when I get the call that says we've got a kind of a big problem, we really kind of need you here, that means something, right? As opposed to, you know, other projects, usually local projects where they, they say, okay, can you stop by the job site? And they, you know, I get that call once or twice a week sometimes. And so being able to do all that remotely kind of, adds emphasis to when you really need to do it in person. And that, you know, I think Andy was on board for that one too. He was even, he was even in uh, South Carolina and basically I got everybody, including the subs in a room, hammered out solutions on site, anything we couldn't do that day. You know, everybody knew we needed to do quickly to make sure that things got done. 
But I think the other thing that's helpful with remote is, you know, we had the federal projects tend to be national projects in that they pull people in from all over the country, whether that's on the army side or whether that's on the contractor or consultant side. You know, I, military projects take me all over the country. And, and one thing that I think a lot of people don't appreciate is it takes time to get there still. So if you're, may, if you're doing in-person meetings in South Carolina all the time, that means it's not just a you know, two hour meeting for me. It's two hours plus six hours to get there, plus six hours to get home, plus <laughs> reimbursables for flights and rental cars and whatnot. So if you can make those remote instead, all of a sudden something that you had to get done in two hours, I'm perfectly willing to sit on like a four hour meeting if I need to, to hammer things out instead of doing a one hour or two hour meeting in person, because you actually, you still saved me 10 hours, even though it's a longer meeting and we got to hammer more things out. So I think that's one thing that I appreciated on this project is I actually did not have to go to South Carolina as much as I was anticipating. And uh, we were actually able to get more done with the time we had because it wasn't spent, you know, doing unproductive things like traveling or getting ready to travel. Sure. Okay, so uh, on to the next question, and Mark, you touched on this before, but uh, maybe some more examples are, if you can think of them, or uh, details on um, describing some of the, the challenges on this pro uh, project in connecting different materials and trades together, and how you ever overcame those challenges. Yeah, so the big meeting that Jimmy mentioned was actually for the operable partitions, which was all over the project. And that was actually one where we did have to pay a lot of attention and actually get feedback from vendors early on because some of the operable partitions were glass. And we wanted to make sure that since we were providing a steel structure for the roof and we were hanging all this from the roof, that uh, our roof wasn't going to deflect too much for some of these really actually long partitions the longest one was like 80 feet long I think and so that getting that feedback early and providing uh, kind of some extra tolerance in our designs I think too so providing slotted holes instead of maybe standard holes or providing oversized holes to give uh, when things do inevitably move around a little bit or construction tolerances say concrete tolerance is not as tight as steel tolerance you know get, giving that room to move was really, really critical, I think, when you're marrying multiple materials together. And then like I touched on earlier, providing the embed plates in the ICF walls where you would maybe cut out a little bit of the ICF form, use the embed plate as the form, and then just cast like you normally would. That, that was something that we had to kind of think out ahead of time, make sure that our rebar could still fit, that it wouldn't conflict with the studs, that we had any, you know, if we were connecting it at the top, at the, top of a wall, making sure that we had space for uh, hairpins to go around the studs to make sure they don't just rip out the top of the wall during the hurricanes that we have to design for in South Carolina. So there was a lot of that going on. And I remember in these steel shops, I actually spent a lot of time on this project, probably twice as much time on the steel shops as I normally spend. And a lot of that was coordinating dimensions, coordinating tolerances, because we had steel connecting into IF, we had steel to steel, of course, we had steel to CMU, we had steel to precast, but there's not a whole lot of other things that you can connect steel to that we didn't do on this project. So making sure that everything was kind of exactly where it needed to be, that I, I agreed where it needed to be, Andy agreed where it needed to be with finishes and all that, and then... Uh, actually putting in that work ahead of time instead of just kind of rubber stamping the shops and sending them out to the field and dealing with whatever fallout may come from that. Did you guys utilize the, uh, did you use a, a model to um, put all these pieces together and kind of see it visually? Um, is, that, is that how you yeah. did that? Yeah, you know, yes, that's correct. We utilized the uh, I read it uh, for the process. And, and I believe, and I believe the steel sub did a te te Tecla or similar. I, I feel like I remember going through models with them to troubleshoot problem areas in three dimensions because between 
the roof and, and the partitions and everything else, we had steel coming in at all sorts of different levels and conflicting with each other. And, some, and, and then you add MEP in it too. We did the best we could during design, but there's just nothing like going through the shop drawing process. So that I, I think they had their model too that was partially based on ours and then they kind of took it above and beyond what we even did. <laughs> You know, you know, from a design and constructability standpoint, there were some unique uh, variables that, you know, probably in the private sector don't come to light as much uh, as they did in the military sector, but we had some unique challenges with the roof. Have you noticed on the overall being a um, uh, standing seam metal roof? Uh, you know, you look at some of the expanses or spans of some of those panels, uh, they couldn't be trucked in, you know, due to their length. And the military had some very specific requirements on their seaming and, and connections. So uh, one of the uh, solutions that was utilized in this project is field forming uh, the metal roof panels. Uh, probably one of the more unique experiences I've seen uh, on site. And we had some, uh, you know, some challenging, I would say challenging connections in regards to expansion, you know, with different materials and they're the main, the building separated by a, a firewall and an expansion joint. And that's probably one of the more challenging expansion joint conditions, trying to get material, you know, working through ICF, precast panels, CMU, uh, metal roofing, all in the same location and, and trying to analyze those, those properties of uh, expansion, contraction, movement. Uh, that was some unique uh, challenges. A lot of conversations occurred there between uh, myself, Mark, Jimmy, uh, Clint, who was the other job site foreman, and then, um, all of our subs on site, making sure that it was installed correctly. Uh, I you know, remember being out there uh, on site looking at it, and just <laughs> before I got there hoping and praying it was right, and they nailed it. But uh, there was, you know, there are some of those unique challenges. We spent a lot of time, especially with the ATFP requirements, simple things that um, we put together fairly quickly, we had to analyze like uh, window connections, door connections. Not only how do they look aesthetically, but how do they anchor to the concrete? How do they meet those requirements? Um, you know, we, don't, we spent a lot of time with that. No, I was gonna say, we spent a lot of time with that. And, and anybody who's worked with the military or uh, government projects, or even uh, really tried to study or dive into the uh, thermal air barrier uh, requirements in buildings and how we, how we make that occur here was also a, a challenge that, that took a lot of time, quite a bit of time. Yeah, he, Danny mentions the uh, the, the uh, window connections. That was another big constructability aspect that was kind of a challenge because ICF does not lend itself that well to connecting in uh, windows for blast designs. Um, anybody who hasn't done ATFP before, I mean, the, the, the windows, normally the structural engineers don't even think about it. It's a window. I don't, I don't really care. You just screw it into the frame and be done with it. Um, but for ATFP, you're not resisting wind you're resisting bombs and blast, and, and I guess technically it is wind from a physics standpoint, but instead of, you know, your normal 30 to 40 PSF load, it's like 30 to 40 PSI load, really, really large loads. So you, where you'd normally just screw things in with, you know, your number 12 screws or whatever into the, into the uh, framing, here we've got into the concrete half inch anchors you know, a, a couple feet on center around the entire window to hold the thing in against blast loads. And with ICF, we had, uh, we kind of had to come up with unique details for it because the, the ICF, they have usually like an inch, an inch and a quarter of foam, kind of like the same thickness as a, as a CMU face shell. And they, and I actually, it might've even been up to two inches on this project. And that was, between the concrete and the window buck, there is now two inches of basically from a structural standpoint air that I need to figure out how to fill and get my anchors, which they're huge anchors, but when you're against blast loads and trying to cantilever two inches, they fail pretty quick. Um, and, and just getting that to work with kind of what the ICF guys were telling you you needed to do, where they want you to use the end dams because that's what you would normally do. But on this project, we might actually want to take them off at the windows so that we can not have that two-inch gap and connect the uh, windows directly to concrete. And, uh, and that means some supplemental forming you'd have to do, which Jimmy had to deal with and didn't complain too much about. <laughs> and yeah, that, well, that of, many details, yeah. 
Well, well, kind of what Mark was saying is, and this goes back to the early meetings in construction, is, is we were able to realize this was a problem early on before we actually started placing um, a bunch of these windows and framing them and, uh, and, and looking at that. And, and we were able to remove, again, what, what Mark said was uh, the supplier wanted, wants to sell you a turnkey. They want to make the most money they can here, use our end dams, use our, use our, our brick ties, use all these different components that we sell. And it'll work, trust us. Well, we ended up early on realizing that the, those end dams just were useless to us almost. And even when you frame them, the weight of the concrete wants to blow those, those end dams out. You still have to account for it and, and put a bunch of uh, uh, wood members in place, uh, spreaders in place to prevent the, those, those styrofoam pieces from blowing out. Well, we're, we're, we're doing this anyway why don't we just go ahead and pay for treated lumber let, and, and let's pour it with that in place and leave it there. There's no reason for, you know, our subcontractor, I think they, they upcharged us for the treated lumber and, and gave us some money back for, for labor for not removing the, the form work once it, once it was poured. But um, you know, it was, it was minimal, but, it, but it, it helped to advance it and actually saved us a little bit of time as opposed to, to ripping out lumber once we're done pouring those, those openings. And if you guys, uh, we, we kind of flipped through those exterior photos fast, but this had a, a lot of windows uh, in it. And it was, that was one of the things that Zodia wanted was a lot of daylight for these students to, to you know, to better their environment. So um, again, something, something we learned and, and learned it early on. So it didn't come back and, and, and hurt us in the end and we'd have to figure out what to do. And then I think the design build process and having Petra involved early and their subs involved early was really, really helpful to that too, because like Jimmy said, we could troubleshoot these things during design or if they slip through design, we could troubleshoot them during the pre-con meeting and, and don't get into a situation where you're going into the field and ready to install your windows and you go to screw them in and, and you're screwing into air because that's, kind of the nightmare scenario. Those windows take forever to buy and, and acquire. Aside from what we've already talked about, uh, how else was BIM used to um, uh, improve uh, the project constructability? You guys have any additional comments about that? Well, it's, I mean, it's far enough it's far enough along, obviously, in, in its use and in its um, popularity that it, it's got that real-time quick ability that helps just look at basic conditions uh, right off the bat. You know, it has that real-time ability to, to see things in three dimension, you know, quickly. Uh, you could, we use it here, uh, obviously, we use it here internally uh, to start the, the interior design process to to troubleshoot uh, issues, you know, clash detection, Navis works. We, we went through that process uh, for the first time, or one of the first times, I should say, in our office with it that helped, you know, find some of the challenges. It, it wasn't perfect. You know, we did still have some challenges in the field, uh, things that maybe weren't correct. You know, you're really relying, obviously, on your entire team to take the time to model it correctly. It, it, the output is only as good as the input, right? So, uh, you know, I would say we uh, give us a passing grade for what we discovered and what we found, but, you know, it still had some of its quirks and, and some of its challenges that we've discussed here already today that we had to work out. It's just a, it's a great tool uh, to get real information quickly, uh, to, to, to isolate those problems, to, to find connection issues, to find nuances where different materials may come together and how's this gonna work or do I have all these details covered? It, it, it's, I'd say it helped, but it's becoming so commonplace now that you just kind of take it for granted uh, compared to you know, prior versions of technology like AutoCAD or ways that we would have drawn in the past. You know, it, it was nice, we, we do turn the models over um, to the, the team in the field and they do utilize it during construction or they did utilize it in construction. They could pull up certain things. They could use it to ask questions of us and um, it kind of helped uh, ourselves also kind of understand maybe what we need to do differently as a firm and how to improve our service to them. 
How close do you think we are to uh, operating in an environment where we don't have drawings so that we're just building from the model? Oh, I, that's a hard one for me to say only because I'm uh, I'm a little bit, uh, I shouldn't say, a little bit old school still. And uh, like I said, you're really, really, really basing it on getting everything absolutely perfect in your model, uh, which, you know, I, I would say you're probably, yeah, it's, it's going to come to that, right? We're starting to already go to job sites. So you don't even have the paper copy on the site or, you know, everybody's got their tablets and then you're pulling it up. Uh, through technology, but uh, I don't know. I, I, it's coming. I just can't really say when. I would say we're probably pretty close from a technology standpoint, but I don't think as an industry we're necessarily ready from a liability and legal standpoint because I think that that's what our, you know, insurance companies and lawyers tell us is we need to be real careful when we review models because between there just being so many elements to it and there being metadata on the elements, there's just so much to review that's practically impossible. You're going to miss something. So we're, we're still being coached to keep it to drawings as best you can. I think it is coming, but we need to evolve our understanding a little bit. And I'll touch on BIM too a little bit. I mean, I, what was real helpful for us was having all the systems in there and we could kind of do a better job of keeping ourselves out of the way than we would normally do. I, I remember multiple instances where we would reduce joist sizes or go with maybe a heavier but squatter beam to be able to keep our structure out of those clear story windows or not fouling with the ceiling assembly. Or uh, we had some kind of short areas where we actually had to shorten up our joists a little bit to create more room for uh, mechanical, mechanical ducting. And speaking of mechanical ducting, because of the layout of the school and it just being kind of neighborhoods where everything is wide open, um, we had mechanical rooms, but they were all kind of around the perimeter of the building. And that meant, you know, normally I would use kind of the back wall of the mechanical room as kind of a shear wall for my structure. But this one, the there was so much ducting that had to go through those walls just because of how things was laid, were laid out that um, we ended up totally disconnecting those walls. They had to be CMU for fire reasons, but we ended up totally disconnecting them from the uh, diaphragm, at least from a lateral standpoint, because this was high seismic and we couldn't attract load either. And we were worried that with the amount of holes that we were punching in that wall, that we wouldn't be able to maintain that level of ductility that you need to maintain in high seismic environments. So that was one that, that fortunately got modeled real early on and we were able to see that those you know, using those walls for structure probably wasn't going to be doable and they needed to be basically just infill walls. And if that hadn't have been modeled in BIM, we probably would have, we probably would have missed it because we normally just go ahead and use the walls around the mechanical room as structure. I'd say we do that on probably 90% of our projects, but this one, it wouldn't have worked out that well. <laughs> So, uh, Jimmy, what are your what are your uh, thoughts on on utilize, utilizing BIM as your your basically your source of all the information you need for the job? I mean, if that was available, would you be able to take that and run with it? Not not right now. I, I don't think I don't think BIM's where where it needs to be right now uh, for that to be available to us or for that to be useful to us. I guess. Um, there's a lot to be said about flipping through drawings and having all the different trades spelled out on their own. Now, now BIM, BIM's a great tool um, when it's used properly. I mean, it'll, it'll obviously it's there to show you coordination and conflicts and everything like that. But um, util, utilizing BIM right now to construct in the field, um, it, it, no, not yet. We'll, we'll talk in five, 10 years. We'll, we'll say um, you've also got, a, you know, you got a lot of old school guys in the field right now. And, and I like to think of myself as relatively, relatively new to the industry compared to some of these older guys. And I still feel comfortable with, with, you know, not only, not only drawings, but even hard drawings. Um, it, we've got Procore and, and a lot of people, I think, know what Procore is in the industry. And, and we use that. We've got it on our iPads or our phones, um, our computer, obviously. And, and we can take our iPad out in the field and, and open up drawings real quick out there. But I still find myself a lot of times walking over to a plane table I got out in the field 
with my iPad and still flipping through the drawings to look at some stuff with the guys and, and you know, put a pencil to paper and say, here's what we need to do over here. Um, and that, that's just me. Uh, again, some people might have a different perspective on it. It might be a lead been successfully. I don't know. Andy, do you think, um, and Mark, both, both of you guys, do you think that you, um, if you had an adequate amount of time to complete your design, uh, you know, would that, I, I know that's the challenge. I mean, we get, we get, uh, you know, thrust into the, uh, starting a job before you really had the time or, or money to, to do the design in a very complete, uh, you know, the very complete, um, fashion. And, uh, you know, that, that seems to be just from concrete contractors perspective anyway, it seems to be the biggest, the biggest um, stumbling block between now and, and utilizing them, at least for our work. Um, you know, you just, there's not enough, the designs are not complete when we start to work. And that may not be the case on federal projects like the ones that you guys have done there, but I know in the private industry, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty prevalent. You know, like in this, particularly in this case too, you know, we Mark kind of touched on a little bit, but this one was fast tracked, right? So we had a site package that went first. We had a footings and foundation package that went second. So at that point, you're ninety five percent sure that everything is good to go, but you're still turning the concrete and the footings loose before the the design's done, right? So it's an ever changing document. It's an ever changing uh, design that. You know, we, we talk about it here internally that design is not complete to the job stuff because you're, you're always changing, you're always making adjustments, you're always tweaking. Um, I sure would love to have all the information in everybody's hands right off the bat, but it, it just sometimes doesn't happen. In this case, with our schedule, we, we had to get aspects of it moving before the, the overall design was done just because of our time standpoint. But I think if you had the right amount of time and you had the right amount of, of tools and you had the right people, uh, internally or, or your, your staff or your production folks and, and right consultants and it, it, it can be done, but um, it's just a, a situation where, in my opinion, things are always changing no matter what, and they're always going to change. And it's how you stay on top of it and how you keep that communication open is how you get the best complete design. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Next question I had here, um, are there any recent advances or a BIM or other technology that would have been helpful on this project that you weren't, uh, weren't uh, what wasn't available to you when you, when you constructed this project that are available to you now? Um, big thing would be, you know, it was available at the time we just didn't utilize it here internally, but uh, A360, you know, as part of Revit, would, is, is something that we use now, um, almost you know for every project almost. But uh, uh, or, or Jimmy or anybody when we uh, any architect goes through, the, Jimmy mentioned move this wall five feet, move this two feet, blah blah. blah. Um, to have that ability to have that update in real time uh, without having to you know extract a model, send it over through a file transfer system, wait for Mark to get it, Mark to upload it, make his adjustments, <laughs> get Mark's model back. Uh, you know, see that in real time and having models linked and, and moving forward. Uh, you know, we've, we've gotten stronger uh, with our technology use in regards to BIM, but also uh, clash detection so we could pick up some of these challenges beforehand. Um, you know, other tools that were out there in the industry that, that we utilize are, are utilizing more Bluebeam and colla uh, Bluebeam collaborative markup sessions that we could share with each other um, for drawing review and comment would also uh, Help to expedite time, in my opinion. You know, we were still uh, marking up PDFs or starting to market PDFs digitally, but some of it was old fashioned hand markups and scanning and sending around and that kind of stuff. So, um, this project we have, you know, started in 2017, so we're not talking that long ago, but over the three year window, our use of tools is uh, really ramped up. And I would love to, we always talk about this, we'd love to have a comparison project, right? To see how much time it would have saved if we could do it the, the same way. It'd be interesting to see what kind of uh, not only like time savings but uh, collaboration we could have done. Yeah, I'd, I'd say A three hundred and sixty is a big one, and the other big one that Andy touched on at the end is Bluebeam. Uh, we've been starting starting to use Bluebeam Studio for um, 
kind of doing real time markups of drawings and we've done it both internally where we actually, you know, we uh, our some of our drafters actually work from their houses right now. So it's actually been really useful to be able to, instead of sending them a bunch of different PDFs of markups, we just have one repository where we every markup that we have and they pick it up, they kind of highlight it off when they're done. And, and it's been really a time saver for us internally, but we've also seen that migrate into actual project teams on federal work and other and, and elsewhere. Where, where when we get a review from the government or in, in federal work, they also have what's called an ITR, which is an independent technical review, which is supposed to be an independent design professional who goes over your drawings before they even get to the government. Um, we'll take their reviews and actually upload them to studio and everybody can be working on them and marking up responses and comment responses at the, uh, at the same time. And you can kind of flag things for people too and ping them and say, hey, can you look at this? Hey, can you know? And, and that's been real helpful. And we've really, that's really only exploded in the last few years, I'd say. And uh, uh, Jimmy's joined us, so we'll get back to uh, our questions. Um, next one I had on my list here was, how is working with the federal government different than working for traditional private clients? And I'll start with uh, Jimmy. Um, there's a whole lot more regulations, rules and regulations you have to follow that you just, it, the nice part about having a design build project is you've got the, the architect, the engineers, you, you're working together on it. Um, that's a benefit. And, and I find that the federal market is actually going that way a lot because they want to take the liability off themselves with design. They give you an RFP. Um, they don't care how you make it work, make it work. As opposed to us going back to the government saying, hey, your, your air handler unit's undersized. You know, we'll, we'll wait while you guys figure it out, come back to us, and then we'll submit a change order on it. So the government's going a lot towards more um, design build projects. But even when the architect comes or the engineers come and give you a solution, you still have to go to the government and say, hey, guys, here, here's what the architect wants us to do. Is this acceptable? Um, on the private side, well, the architect, you know, unless it's changing the, the look really, you're, you, the, the architect says it's acceptable, it's acceptable, you move on from it there. So you've got that, that layer of, of checks and balances, on, well, the second layer of checks that you don't have typically in the, the private market. Um, also, uh, money's a big thing. Um, you know, when you, when you have a change or, or a, a design deviation or whatever the reason is that, that you, 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 you're going after a change order, um, the government has a whole lot more uh, scrutiny um, with it, with the, with the funding and, and everything. And it's not just yes or no, hey, we'll take the price. No, we won't take the price. There's a whole lot more of a uh, validation needed. And, and not to say that you're out there trying to, to pass one by on an owner, but you might take 30, 60 days for your pricing to get approved with the government where you go to an owner and say, hey, it's going to be an extra $10,000 for us to, to change this wall around. You want us to do it or not, and they might tell you right away, yes, go for it. So those are some of the, the items that you run into when, when you go to a federal market versus a, a, a private market. How about from the designer's perspective, Mark? I think the, the key thing, and I see it with uh, when I work with consultants who haven't really done too much federal work, is that they can be somewhat rigid in what they want. They, I mean, they put a lot of effort into the RFPs and, uh, and you kind of have to deliver exactly what they want, exactly what they say. And you can't really pull a fast one on them because there's on every single one of these projects that I've done, I've done many dozens, hundreds of federal projects. There is always somebody on the federal side who knows every single word of that 2000 page RFP. And on this project, his name was Chuck. And he knew every freaking word of this of this RFP. So you, it, it can be very rigid. I mean, we we pull it out and we'd be like, okay, so this is our design, and we're providing you know you know 220 key count for the door. And he'd whip out the RFP, switch it to page 1,635, and be like, no, I think we're supposed to have 222 keys on this one. They they're just very 
rigid. You need to do kind of exactly what they asked. They put a lot of effort into getting this. And they, like Jimmy mentioned on the money side, they got a specific amount of money from Congress for this project, usually. So you can't just go and add, you know, money here or money there because they don't, they haven't been authorized to spend that money. If it's too much, they actually have to go back to Congress and get some more. And that is not fast. So there, there's a lot of cost pressure on them to keep it where it needs to be. And so they put a lot of effort into the RFPs to get exactly what they want and they'll hold you to it. Even if it doesn't make sense sometimes to you, I think one of the issues, one of, one of the items I've seen, I think it came up on this project is like surveyors now, they usually, when, when you do surveying for private jobs, they just upload their, the civil engineer just uploads the coordinates to the surveyor digitally and that's the end of it. Um, that's not what the military wanted. They wanted the survey points on the drawing, even though it's a design build and the surveyor is part of the design build team and you can just hand, turn around and hand it to them. They wanted it on the drawings on this project, which is something that, you know, isn't always done. And there's examples like that all over the place in the military. So you just kind of have to pay attention to what they want and recognize that they're probably not going to back down from it. I mean, they, most of these projects, they wait several years to get funding from Congress for it. They're perfectly willing to outweigh you for a couple months on something that you want to do and they don't want you to do. So I think that's the, the big thing for me is the rigidity and giving them exactly what they want because they've put a lot of thought and effort into figuring that out. Literally it takes an act of Congress. <laughs> the, other, the other challenge, if you don't do federal work or you're not accustomed to it, is uh, there's a whole other set of criteria or codes that you have to follow. Um, the UFC codes or the Unified Facilities criteria that you that they tell you in the RP that apply to this. So there, there are cases where sometimes the codes don't align. I mean, very few, but between uh, IBC, uh, you know, which is our standard, uh, and the UFC codes um, or even accessibility codes, they're you, sometimes you kind of run into a gray area that you have to ask a lot of questions. And for us, that was a big learning curve, um, just making sure that uh, we were following the correct criteria. I mean, you look at the number of UFCs that applied to this project and uh, you, you thought you have a solution and you back check and you, you'd read and read some more, read some more. And um, it was a little, a little challenging at first. Once you, once you do a project or two, like anything else, you get the hang of it. But uh, learning those other codes were a little bit of a nuance. Uh, let's see. Next question I had was, um, so this project utilized uh, a significant amount of insulated concrete formwork. Um, what were some of the, the um, what were some of the uh, lessons learned um, and what challenges did this type of system pose for the team? Yeah, from, from the architecture side, we had to work a lot with base uh, and Mark to, to understand it. We've not to that point have used that, material or that technology that it was a first for us. So we had to go to school uh, from square one and, and you know, we've seen it and most of us uh, around the office, you know, knew of people who used it or maybe did it on a, a, an extremely small scale, but nothing like this. And so we had to learn how the material works. Uh, you know, we reached out, like Mark mentioned, we talked a lot with the vendors. We talked a lot with their engineering support to make sure that we, un we fully understood the, the material that we were using. And then how that translates not only to structure, but also uh, to the thermal envelope, uh, to the air barrier, and, and how we make those systems work uh, for the project requirements. Yeah, I, I would say similar to Andy, like anything else, you know, if you're working with something new, do your homework up front. Don't just go, don't just jump into it because you really don't want to be figuring it out in the field. Um, and fortunately for us, we had worked with ICF before. So this project, there weren't, too many hiccups from our standpoint. Um, we learned our lessons on those other projects and then we didn't have to learn them here. Uh, like one of the ones, like I mentioned earlier, was you know just paying attention to the rebar detailing to make sure you don't end up with da you know, damming up your concrete and ending up with voids that you may or may not find until it's much harder to fix them. Um, eliminating unnecessary reinforcing so you're not uh, 
don't have any trouble with consolidation, that sort of thing. The other one that was a big one from a previous pro, you know, previous projects for us was just, we've done, they, they make ICF as thin as I think four inches and it can be done, but it's, it's hard and it requires, um, you know, a, a contractor who is really, really used to working with it, not even a contractor, even a sub. And, uh, so I, I think even my boss's house is four inch ICF. Uh, it, it, it's once you get that, then it's really hard to fit things in and make sure that everything is consolidated well. So we ended up, we probably could have pushed to six inches on this one, but we ended up holding on to an eight inch wall just to make sure that we would have space for everything that uh, we wouldn't have any blowouts or voids or other issues during construction. And then we did have some big spans for the ICF vertical spans too, that we would have had to go eight inch anyways or do pilasters or something like that. So I think that was a lesson learned on previous projects to just uh, pay a little bit more attention to the detailing than perhaps we normally would on a concrete wall where, we're, where you pull off the forms and you can actually see any defects you have and, uh, and paying attention to the mix design too. Do you have anything to add to that, Jimmy? And uh, oh, not really. I mean, they, they covered it pretty well. I, I it's definitely a it was a new system to me, so I had a learning experience myself on the job with it. And luckily, I was uh, I had a good subcontractor that was very familiar with the system, uh, knew what they were doing, and they were able to actually uh, teach me some stuff about how they were putting it together and and. I think that was a big thing was was being willing to to learn from them and, and see what they how they've done in the past and 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 just take it as a learning experience for me about the system and and going forward knowing you know some tips and tricks about putting it together um, but there was a lot of a uh, a lot of inspections that went on because we were tying two systems together where we had we had a lot of embed plates we had a lot of anchor bolts that were cast into these walls uh, pockets that all had to be pretty specific when when the steel's coming out there. Um, obviously, again, Mark Mark talked about the tolerances with the steel. Well, same thing with these these structural components going into the wall. Can't be too far off with those. So having a good subcontractor out there with the new system was was pretty beneficial to me. Very good. So we have uh, one question from the audience, and that is um, so Jimmy, you might have to use uh, earmuffs on this one. <laughs> Uh, but does the uh, does the panel uh, think that bringing the general contractor into the, into the design phase is a worthwhile effort to improve the constructability, even in a design bid build scenario? I mean, I'll answer that. And I think for me, it's yes. Though it depend with the caveat that it depends on who it is. It, like anything else, it needs to be the right partner. Um, I've, this design build job went really well. And one of the reasons it went well was Petker was invested from the beginning, actually looking at things and helping to troubleshoot the constructability from day one. Um, a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot, what some contractors do when they get into design build is they treat it just like they would a design bid build job and they don't really look at anything until the design is complete. And at that point, it's too late. So I've had projects where I, it was in theory design build, but I never got any of my questions answered until 100% CDs were done. And then I had contractors furious at me for what we showed, but I've been asking questions for six, seven months and I haven't heard anything. So I think yes, but it's important to have a contractor that is going to take it seriously and actually look at it and provide real feedback and I think having people who are actually going to be in the field like Jimmy looking at it is helpful as well, rather than, uh, you know, the guys, guys like Chad who just hang out in the office. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Andy? What are your comments? Uh, I agree completely with Mark. Uh, they've got to, it's got to be somebody that you trust, but it's also, you know, from an architect side, it's got to be somebody who's flexible, uh, you know, Architects like to be creative. Architects like to, in some cases, push the envelope. Uh, as long as you have a partner that's willing to to look at the design, really invest the time to figure it out, uh, or, or help you figure it out, so to speak, or provide feedback is great. Uh, I, we don't. 
obviously take kindly to coming up with a, a design set, you know, a unique design, so to speak, and then just being, you know, not only trash, but just told it's not I'm never going to work and don't even try it. You got to have that partner that's willing to be creative. You know, this project specifically, something that I don't get a lot to see with the uh, design build partners is the fact that uh, it's budget driven. And I, I still remember going into this and uh, winning the project and getting into the uh, interior aspect of it. And rarely do you hear the general contractor say, you know, be creative. Let's do some nice stuff in here. Uh, that, that was kind of unique where they were uh, willing to challenge us to, you know, do some push, not a push down vote, but, you know, liven it up, make it nice. And uh, when you have a partner like that, that's invested in it too, that, you know, at the end of the day, their name's on it just as much as yours is. Uh, it makes the, the process a lot easier. These guys also offered a tremendous amount of feedback when it came to um, constructability, detailing, ways to, to think about the project, ways to think about uh, putting it together. That, you know, like Mark mentioned, we cut it off before we got into construction. So I think that helped streamline everything. Yeah, I think that's where design build really goes right is when you're doing it up front. And because by the time you get into construction, I mean, you, we really didn't have that many RFIs. We really didn't have that many fixes that we had to do because everybody's been on the same page for months by that, by that point. So it, it, when it's done right, yeah, I think it's absolutely a benefit. And, and that includes in private sector jobs too. I've been involved in uh, whether it's design build or design kind of assist projects on the private side. It's been really helpful, especially when you're doing something a little bit new that have contractors involved and they can, you know, tell you whether that's a good idea or whether that's a crappy idea or, you know, whether how, how expensive this is going to be or what the, or if you're in a new area, I, that was one of my questions. I had not worked in South Carolina before. I had done things in the Southeast, but not specifically North Carolina, South Carolina. So being able to have a general contractor and subs on board while I'm designing, I can actually pep you with questions. Hey, do what do you guys like to do? In my area of the country, when I'm attaching roof deck down to my structure, they just like to use the Hilti pins. If I show welds, they're going to try and VE it out all the time. So do I even bother on this one or should I just go straight to Hilti pins? And they're like, no, we like welding down here. So it's, it's, it's good to have those people to bounce questions off and you can save yourself some time later on, whether it's in RFIs or change orders or whatever. We had, you know, a unique aspect of our coordination meetings that we had, um, like, like Mark mentioned, you know, one of the major drivers we had, our, our MEP uh, contractors, they were on our conference calls and they were actively providing design feedback every meeting, Walker White, they were extremely great to work with and they were uh, practical, they were very um, focused, but when you, when you're help, when they have that vested interest in helping in design or providing design input or design feedback. Um, it's just a great way to start a project. You're not bringing somebody in cold that's never seen a project, a mechanical or a contractor that's has never seen anything. So even the, some of the major subs of the project were on board and ready to hit the ground running uh, by the time design was complete. Very helpful. And Jimmy, I was just picking on you. I knew what the answer to the question was going to be I was pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what are your comments about that? Uh, you know, how would you uh, recommend that, uh, you know, general contractors and trade contractors be a good partner in that, in that type of environment? Uh, so really you get asked back to the table. Yeah, no, hundred um, percent. You know, obviously we have a whole lot more of a vested interest when it's a, a design build project, the design bid, you know, if, if we've got a, a if we, if we got a relationship with an architect, we'd love, you know, obviously we'd come in and, and give them our opinion type of thing. Um, with a design build project, we, we really, obviously we're brought in on the front end. We're <clears throat> involved in the whole thing, but what Andy said is, is spot on. We, we bring, you know, the way the architect should, should kind of bring us into it. Um, we, we on every design build project that I do, I've got my key contractors already that, that I've the project with that I know who my MAPs are. Um, once I've got that project and I'm in design, I'm not, unless there's a huge red flag or we run into an issue, I'm not, I'm not swapping over to another, uh, mechanical or electrical contractor. Those, those guys got me to the, you know, got me to the table. I'm, I'm going to go the whole way with them. And, and they really help with their input because we're, we're not next. As general contractors, we've got a wider range of knowledge. We're not 
experts in any one trade. And that's what we have have heavy hitters for when it comes to those specific trades. And they bring to the table, you know, that they can tell us where we're going wrong, where we're going right, or even how to save money on it. Um, so, so I think the, the more minds talking about problems and solutions, the better. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, you know, from a trade contractor's perspective, uh, you know, it's important for a general contractor to recognize those efforts, you know, and like you're saying, you don't want to change, you don't want to change horses, uh, you know, what, when you go into construction with somebody that's really thought through the project with you and all that, and we all recognize that it's not, uh, you can't overcome huge cost differences between, uh, you know, different competitors and that kind of thing and wouldn't expect you to because uh, you're working in the best interest of the owner. But, um, you know, having that mindset, at least, you know, that there is some benefit to the, the trade contractors uh, for participating at that level certainly encourages that kind of participation. I think the, the, the way that the federal government does procurement can help encourage that as well, because one of the big things in putting teams together is how have you worked together before? So they actually want to see teams that have long histories of doing things together and doing it well. They want to see those teams stay together and keep working together on their projects. So that speaks more to Jimmy's point too, and that he usually knows who he's, who he's going to use up front because a lot, some of the time they were actually in on the bidding. They were actually part of the, part of the submittals to win the project. Very good. Well, uh, I don't see any more questions from the audience. Um, that's, those are all the questions that I had written down for the group. Any uh, closing comments from any of the three of you? We'll start with, uh, start with Andy. Um, no, nothing more to add than what we've already covered. I appreciate the ability to be a part of this today. Um, we always like to talk about our successes as a, as a team and uh, kind of showcase some of our work. So uh, again, thank you for, for uh, allowing me to participate today. Well, thank you very much. And Mark, what are your, your comments? You, you were uh, a huge part of uh, pulling all this together. Actually, you were the, the person that pulled it all together. And uh, I appreciate that. And we, we talked about this a year and a half ago, I think, in the uh, Constructability Committee. Uh, so uh, I appreciate the, uh, all the effort that you put forth here and love to hear any closing comments that you have. Yeah, thanks. I, I think, I think my main comment to take away from this is I think a lot of the focus and constructability is on, you know, detailing and making sure that you're looking at interference and that sort of thing. And, and that's important, but what we focused on a lot today and what I think is an overlooked portion of constructability is building good teams and having good communication because in the end, these are people building these buildings and, and a lot of the construction problems that are tend to be, people problems. So it's important to not ignore that, that portion of it and build a good team, make sure that communication is open and going well. I mean, it, I, I've given talks on constructability before and I look up, uh, I look up like reasons for claims. I call my up our insurance provider and ask, you know, what are the claims on projects? Where do they come from? And they say, actually, most of the claims, they don't really come from technical problems. They don't really come from technical know-how. Usually their communication, people aren't talking to each other. People aren't coordinating correctly. So focusing on the people aspect can save you a lot more hassle than even maybe, and than even maybe making sure the design is right. Even sometimes it's more important to make sure that it's coordinated and everybody is uh, kind of on the same page and treating each other right. That's a great comment. Jimmy, what are your closing comments, thoughts? Um, uh, nothing additional, really. I think uh, I think we covered everything pretty well about it all. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity to come and, and talk about the project. Like Andy said, it's it's nice to share the success one. Um, you know, th this was one to be proud of. Um, it really came together, the the whole team and everything. So I appreciate it. Well, thank you all very much. I uh, appreciate the effort that you put forth here and uh, congratulations on a magnificent pro project. It's, uh, it's pretty stunning uh, looking at the pictures and uh, comparing that to what we traditionally know as a elementary school of construction. This is uh, definitely something special. So 
congratulations on pulling that together. It looked great. And I'm sure that the, uh, the rest of the audience would agree with that. And thank you to all of our participants that, um, that joined us today remotely. Uh, again, I wish uh, from the Carolinas chapter uh, of the ACI, I wish we could have hosted you here. We'd love to see you another time.